Great. Uh, welcome and uh, thank you for waiting. We are thrilled to launch today's webinar. Uh, my name is Mike Shannon. I'm our CEO here at PacBec, chiming in for a quick introduction to truly the VIP uh, of the day, Dr. Uh, Kathleen Cat West of the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, who will be leading today's webinar, a uh, fascinating one which uh, revolves around some observations uh, Kat has been making on the impact of student participation in final grades as it pertains to PACBAC versus LMS discussion. Without further ado, introducing Dr. Kat West. Thank you. A little bit about me first. So um, I have a degree in psychology, um, and then I went to um, the Medical University of South Carolina and worked on a PhD in neurosciences and then was asked to do um, a postdoctoral fellowship in biochemistry. So I've kind of been all over the face. Um, I teach a lot of different types of courses and in a lot of different ways. So I've taught traditional classes, 100% online courses, and what we call hybrid courses, which are one day a week, usually with some sort of online component. And I've also taught all different sizes from a very small um, I have 16 students this semester and a senior seminar course, all the way to some really huge sections of intro, um, 350 or, or more. And again, I've taught a lot of different types of classes. And so for the past several years, I had been using a tool um, that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today and some of the data that I was curious about. But before we even do that, I want you to guys to get involved a little bit. So if you will, just wherever you are, at your desk or computer or wherever you're sitting, write out a discussion question. So if you were a student in your class, what, what kind of a discussion question would you want them to ask? Um, it could be anything. I'll give, I'll give you an example. So in one of my uh, physiological psychology classes, they might ask something like, you know, something about a brain region or something about a disorder that we were talking about. So just some kind of discussion question. Again, use your subject, use your discipline um, you can just write it on a scrap piece of paper somewhere um, and hold on to that because that question is going to be relevant a little bit later in this webinar. All right. First thing we're also going to do after this is a little bit of finding out who is watching and who we are. So what I want you to do is from these three statements, you're going to see a poll pop up in just a second. I want you to select which one best describes you. So I love to teach writing skills to students, and I do it as often as I can. I don't love to teach writing skills, but I'm required to do so by my school. And I don't love to teach writing skills, and I actively avoid it if possible. So which one just best describes you, please? What we'll see in just a minute after a few people participate is kind of who we've got here in this audience. Let's give it another five or 10 seconds for anybody else that might want to jump in and participate here. All right, so what you can see, oh, got a little bit of last minute participation there. We have a pretty interesting mix. Um, it keeps going somewhere between 50-50 and somewhere between a few more of us that love to teach writing skills and do so as often as I can. First of all, that makes me incredibly happy um, because that's a big thing that we're going to be talking about today is how to do that and even how to do that easier. And then the second one, I don't love teaching, but I'm required to do so by my school. Don't worry, this is actually probably even more geared for you than it was for the first group of participants. Because what I'm hopefully going to show you today is that teaching writing doesn't have to be as challenging as we think it is. And I'm going to hopefully give you a really cool tool. All right, one more exploration of who is in this conversation. So again, which one best describes you? I would be more comfortable teaching writing if I had better writing skills. I'd be more comfortable teaching writing if I had more time or fewer students. And I would be more comfortable teaching writing if I had better technology. So again, which one of those best describes you? Let's take a few seconds and see who we've got in our webinar today. Again, let's take about five more seconds if anybody else wants to jump in our poll here. All right, so let's take a look at what we have. I'm glad to see that we all feel like we at least have the skills that we need. 
Um, I like that most of us said that we'd be more comfortable teaching if we had more time or fewer students. Um, I would go for that if you could get my administration to go for that. And I'm going to guess that your administration is very similar, that we know realistically that's probably not going to happen. So what can we do about it? And what I'm going to hopefully show you if you're in that, that third category or even if you're not, is that if there is better technology, you would do better. And I'm going to tell you there is better technology. So where are we going? Well, here is kind of my idea. So whenever I'm thinking about teaching, whenever I'm working um, with a group of students, I really firmly believe that the more that we can get students to write, the more that they're going to learn. Um, there's a whole lot of psychological literature that's out there that we don't have time to dive into, but we do know, it kind of summarized, that writing helps students improve their critical thinking skills, and that writing also helps students improve their discipline-specific communication. Writing is a big deal, writing is important, but as you guys just told me, writing can be a challenge to grade, it can be a challenge to give feedback, um, and it would be easier if there were fewer students or better technology. I don't know if you're like me at all, um, but I have found some problems or some limitations when I am working with my students, trying to get them to improve their critical thinking skills or their communication skills. Some of those are some of the things that we've just discussed as far as things that we've all run into. Larger class sizes make it harder. More students makes that more of a challenge. It is also harder in online classes, at least when you first consider teaching an online class because you kind of have to switch what you're doing pedagogically. There are also lots of different types of students that you run into. You run into students that have a very solid writing background and then others that do not. Um, we also know that our students today are really good with technology, but in very specific ways. For example, they're really good at writing essays that are 280 characters or less. Um, but that isn't always what we're asking them to do. So in most other disciplines, that, that's not the type of writing style. So getting them to learn and to engage with new types of writing styles is a bit of a challenge um, just because they've practiced so much with that 280 character or less style of writing. We also know that students are very motivated by likes and by followers. This comes from this big age of social media and that that motivates them to want to participate more. If they get more likes, they're going to do more of something. So that's something to keep in mind as both a challenge and perhaps even maybe a future motivator. We also know that students aren't used to thinking and problem solving. If you look um, at my little cartoon joke there on the left, um, this is what I find with a lot of my students is that even though you've explicitly said it in the syllabus or online and you've given examples and you've shown them this and you've done that, they're still going to report that they just can't find it anywhere, even though it is right there. Um, they tend to give up really easily. And that's something that because we know that about these students is something that we need to make sure um, that we're addressing. Right, that we know that this is a tendency for these students and so if we can get them to engage faster before they've given up we're going to have a lot more success and then we've also had this interesting group of students that have grown up believing that opinions are the same thing as facts and they are absolutely not so for example if you're trying to have a discussion in your class about something very controversial here's a big controversial psych issue? Should I spank my child as a form of discipline? You're going to have students all over the place with opinions and they're going to have what they think is evidence. So for example, yeah, spanking is okay because I was spanked as a child and I'm fine. Or no, spanking is not okay. I was not spanked as a child and I'm fine. And it's hard to get them to kind of take that step between, okay, an opinion is fine, but that's not necessarily fact. We need to go and look at what the actual research says and back up our opinion or back up our statement with actual research rather than just something anecdotal. So these are a lot of things that I struggle with when I'm working with my students. Again, still with the goal of trying to improve their critical thinking skills and their communication. All right, last question for you guys and then I'll carry on with what I have learned recently. Which do you prefer? So if you're gonna have your students do something, what would you prefer? To have them write papers or essays to practice writing? to use some sort of discussion post to practice writing or neither because neither of them really seem to work. So which, which camp do you guys fall into? Take a second and give a vote, please. So I can kind of see who I've got here. Give it a few more seconds. All right, if you want to look at our results here, we have a pretty interesting split. Um, the majority say that they prefer writing papers and essays. I used to be one of those. I used to think that was the best way. 
Um, but again, that's because I didn't have the tool that I have now. And I also think it's interesting that some of you said that you don't really want to use either. And I think what that boils down to isn't a lack of your skill or the student ability. I think it's just a lack of you don't have the right tool yet or you haven't figured out all the best tricks yet. So hopefully that's what I'm going to show you a little bit of today. So here's one of the big things that frustrates me. I love discussion boards. I didn't used to, as I just said in the poll, I used to always just do essays and writing. Then I found that, well, wait a minute, maybe I can get them to do more if I have them do more of a discussion. Because with essays or something like that, while they were producing longer pieces um, of, of, of writing, I wasn't able to grade them as fast. I wasn't able to give them as much immediate feedback. And again, these students are used to immediate feedback. So I switched my thinking saying, well, maybe a discussion board is better. But if you've ever used a traditional discussion board in your learning management system, you've probably run into exactly what I've run into. Now keep in mind that these examples are gonna be from a physiological class, but I bet you've seen something similar. So no matter what you tell them the guidelines are, no matter what you tell them they should and should not be doing, all right, the learning management system, you're probably gonna end up something like this. This is week two, all right? The student here asked a fairly decent question about astrocytes, which is a kind of cell in the brain. They had just read a paper on this, so I was actually kind of pleased that a student asked a follow-up question. And then here's what the student responded. Again, this is week two. They should have had two weeks to practice with the rules and regulations. They said, after reading the article pertaining to astrocytes, I completely agree with how amazing they are. I think." As we further research them and get to know them better, we will have the ability to treat many diseases and developments such as the one this person or some other person in the conversation described. In other words, nothing here is new information. They haven't actually contributed anything to this discussion, um, which is again, what I tried to coach them on in the rules is this is the kind of thing that you shouldn't be doing. But again, early on in the semester, maybe they'll get better. So now let's go to week six. If you had to choose one of your senses to have for the rest of your life, which would you choose and why? And this person says, if I had to choose a sensation for the rest of my life, it would be vision. I don't think I could live without it. Vision plays a role in anything. Again, you half answered the question, but you didn't really tell me why. Like, what do you mean it plays a role in anything? And is that exactly the word that you meant? Again, this is week six into a 15-week class. So I had to start shaking my head. Again, maybe it's still early on. Maybe if I give them a refresher of the rules, we'll get better. Right? Then we get into... See if I can get this slide to progress here. We get into week 14. We're almost done with the semester. Yay! And we still get answers like, I completely agree with you. And again, I don't even know if this is a complete sentence, but I just think it's weird that it can go through generations. But my question is, what is the gene that is grunt past? Uh, I don't even know. Again, week 14. And this is the kind of thing as an instructor that just makes me bang my head against a wall and say, I'm never using discussion boards again. Right? Because nobody's got time for that. Nobody's got time to constantly go through and say, here's what the regulations are. Please make sure you've read the guidelines. Please make sure you've done that. Um, and so I was like, there's got to be a better way. And here it is. So what I found a couple semesters ago was a really great tool called Packback. Um, as you all know, or maybe you don't, but hopefully you do, it's an intelligent discussion platform, which means that it's gonna be doing a lot of the work for you. It's got artificial intelligence kind of running behind the scenes. It's helping you as an instructor and helping the students. And the whole goal of it is to help measure and improve soft skills like curiosity. And the one that I was really excited about was critical thinking. In other words, they have some of the same goal that I do is to use this tool to improve critical thinking. I was also really excited that Packback's core objectives line up with things that I value in my teaching. So the first thing that Packback wants to do as soon as the students interact with this platform is to establish a foundation for asking good questions. In other words, Packback is gonna help me help my students learn to ask good questions. It does so by forcing the students to go through a curiosity tutorial. So the very first time the students log on, they're taken through a curiosity tutorial that's gonna show them, here is what makes a good question. Here are things that should be included in a good question. Here are things to avoid when asking a good question. And it will go through this tutorial with the students and do all the teaching that I would have wanted to do, but it did it for me. The second thing that Packback also does that lines up with how I like to teach and instruct is that it, it provides a constant feedback loop. So the students are constantly getting information based on what they have posted as far as how well they're doing. And again, keep in mind the group of students that we see a lot today, they're used to that immediate social media type feedback. So if we can give that when we're teaching them to write, all the better. 
What's really neat about the way Packback does it um, is it does so in what I call a positive reinforcement model. So in other words, it allows you to go through and highlight the things that students have done really well. And it won't just show for that student, but it will show for all students. So here are the things that this is, the reason why this was good so that everyone can see it and hopefully copy this style. So for example, here was a question that one of my students asked that I thought was really, really good. And what I was able to do within the Packback platform was to click the praise button. I, I was able to feature it so that all the students would see the post as well as get um, a weekly update in the email that is sent out about this post. And then I'm able to give specific feedback to the student, again, that everyone will be able to see so they can see why I thought this post was good and hopefully copy the same behaviors. So I said things like, I love that this is an open-ended question. I love that you challenged your classmates to think about this kind of issue. So again, all I did here was encourage this one student using positive reinforcement and then allowing everybody else to see that I had encouraged the students to hope that they'll copy a very similar style. Related to this, um, the Packback platform also allows me to give individual coaching. So now this is just between me and the individual student. So if there's something that a student has done that's not terribly wrong, you don't need to delete it, but they, if they could just work on it just a tiny bit more and tweak one or two little things, this would be a great question. So here's one of those examples. A student asked a question about if you had a bad dream and then you hold a grudge against the person in your dream the next day. And I thought that's a really interesting question because we had been talking about sleeping and dreaming but it wasn't quite related to the content of the class. It was a little more biological. So I gave the student coaching and I gave them, I said, you know, here, here's some stuff to think about. Go back and see if you can relate this to our biopsychology topic more. Maybe what brain regions would be involved. So in other words, I'm giving the student a way to go back and improve it. And again, still giving encouragement. This was really good and interesting. Just make sure you're relating it to the class. So what I love about this, again, very simple. It took me 30 seconds or so to give this feedback, but the student got a very direct individualized way to how to improve their posting. Again, with the idea of featured posts, with that first one that was really good, I featured it. Packback will also help you by featuring posts. So when a post is featured, either by you, the instructor, or by the artificial intelligence running behind the scenes, the students will get a weekly email saying, hey, here are the featured posts this week. It will also, within the platform itself, put a little star next to the post that all students can say, hey, this one was featured. I wonder what's so good about it. Let me go and check it out. And again, that just continues with that positive reinforcement of they know which ones were good and they can go and see why. Here's another example of this feedback loop um, of just one of my students. Um, and I loved this because the student was kind of thinking outside the box here a little bit. So they were asking a question that was related to the course itself, but also like, what can I do with this course? Why is this important to me? And I loved it. So I, I gave the feedback here and I featured it. And I also then gave them a little bit of feedback. And again, this is what the student will see on their end. So if they're like, oh, this post has been featured by Dr. West and has been praised by Dr. West, they'll go and look at it and they'll actually see what I praised. So this is kind of what it looks like from the student perspective and why that positive reinforcement can be so easy yet so effective. Let's say the student did have to be coached for any particular reason. Their post wasn't quite up to standard. It didn't follow the rules and regulations. Um, what happens at this point is they receive a coaching email with specific feedback. Again, why this is important is that it's not just enough to say didn't meet criteria. It tells them why, what they didn't do, why it was moderated, and then what they can do to improve. All of this is just simply going to help them the very next time. And again, happens with super little effort on your part as the instructor, sometimes absolutely no effort if the artificial intelligence tags it for some reason. So again, the student is constantly getting feedback as they are used to, hopefully then to improve with very little effort on the part of the professor. So also this is what it kind of looks like behind the scenes. And this is what I mean by the artificial intelligence really helping you as far as the instructor goes. So what is happening is that Packback's artificial intelligence will go through and moderate or at least evaluate every single post that's put on there. And if necessary, it will moderate a post. 
Once a post has been moderated, then a real live person at Packback, so not you as the instructor, so you don't have to take your time to do this, will go through and will look at each one and decide if it really does need to be deleted or not. And again, this is what they would see on the Packback side. So again, for example, if something was plagiarized, you don't have to worry about screening for that. Packback is going to take care of that. A closed-ended question, so a student would get feedback on this, again, from Packback. doesn't have to be from you, but encouraging them to work on creating open-ended questions next time, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. This is just so easy and so efficient. And again, all of it is happening behind the scenes so that when you interact with the post, you get to do the actual teaching versus more of moderation. So I've been using Packback for a while. And because I am who I am, I, I wanted to know, is it really working? Like it seemed to be working. My students seemed to be doing a whole lot better, but I'm not comfortable with just it seemed to. So I wanted to know with some actual numbers was it doing what I thought it was doing? So last semester I ran a research study. I used three groups of students in three of my online sections of Site 3113, which is my physiological psychology class. Again, I chose to run this online so that the students could have the same basic core content and hopefully try to keep that part the same. So all students watched the same pre-recorded lectures, took the same quizzes, took the same exams, had the same homework. All of that was kept standardized the same um, from the online course. So that the only thing that was supposedly different between the three groups was what I had them do for their interactive discussion. So group one or section one of my class used pack back questions and held weekly discussions with each other. Section two used our LMS to have a weekly discussion using the discussion board that was built into the LMS. And then group three just read quality questions and answers each week, which is just kind of a control scenario to see if reading quality questions and answers and then acknowledging that you'd read them um, would somehow improve their ability to write. The types of data that I collected is I took all their scores on their writing parts of the exam. So they had two parts each exam, a multiple choice part and a writing part. So I'm going to show you the writing stuff. I looked at their final grades. Um, particularly, I was interested to see if this really helped my DFW rate. So this particular course in our department is one of the highest DFW rates. Students find this material challenging. DFW would be the number of students that get a D in the class, an F in the class, or withdraw from the class. And my normal DFW rate is really significant, so I was wondering if, if somehow maybe that was being relieved. Because again, it looked like it was. It looked like I had fewer students that were withdrawing, but I wanted to know for sure. And then I also looked at just their weekly participation. Does the, the type of you know, interaction alter their participation? Oops, excuse me. So the first thing I'm going to show you is just the grades. And I was really happy to actually say there were significant differences in their writing scores. So as you can see, again, section one is the one that used Packback. Section two here in the middle is the group that used the LMS discussion. And then section three was the group that just read quality questions and answers. And as has been demonstrated quite a number of times in the psychology literature, reading questions is not enough. You really need to actually do writing if you're going to expect the students to do writing. Um, so again, what you're seeing here in the light green bars are their midterm writing scores, and then the green bars is their final exam writing scores. And again, I did see significant differences between the groups that used Packback and the groups that just read it all. This was almost significant, but again, I lost a little bit of power, again, probably thanks to that DFW rate. Um, hopefully future studies will be able to kind of relook at this and see if I can see complete significance between all the groups as opposed to just the trends that I think I'm seeing. Here's what I got really excited about though. So here's where I was trying to look at that DFW rate. So I looked at the number of students that got each letter grade in the class. And again, green bars are the students that were doing pack back, yellow bars are the groups that were working with the LMS discussion board, and then the gray bars were the group that were just reading the course. And so you can see here, this is my normal DFW rate. When I say it's terrible, I'm really not kidding. So this is the number of students that would normally have a D, an F, or a W. And you can see a large majority of them ended up with C's in the class. It's pretty typical for what I see. Now take the two groups that use the discussion board. You already see a reduction in the DFW rate, but it's even more significant, particularly the withdrawal rate, which is really exciting, in the group that was using Packback. This is actually a significant difference here, all three of these. So the group that's using Packback stays in the class. They hang in there. They don't just withdraw when it gets tough. And even more exciting than that, on the opposite end of the scoring, right? you can see in my normal class, I didn't have anybody 
that got an A, but I had significantly more students getting A's in the pack fat group and significantly more students getting C's in the other LMS group. So again, it's not even just enough to write. pack fat really does seem to push them up to those higher two letter grades to the A and the B. And then the last thing that I didn't quite know I was going to collect, at least originally, but turned out to be really fascinating, was weekly participation. So again, I got three groups here. The dark line is the group that used Packback. This light line is the group that used, that just read the questions and answers. And again, I would hope they would have good participation because all they had to do is acknowledge that they read something. But here's the group that really surprised me. This is the group that used the LMS discussion board. And if you kind of look at it average from the graph, ignore the yellow for just a minute, you can see the pack bag group had really good weekly participation, which is exciting, right? Because you're asking them to do what should be seemingly a harder task because they don't like writing, but you're asking them to do it weekly and they are doing really well. And they're reliably writing each week. Again, this group reliably clicked the button that said they read it each week. And then this group was all over the place, which was really disheartening. But here's what I noticed when I went back and reevaluated what was going on here. The reason they weren't getting participation scores each week is because I required them as an all or nothing, either you did it or you didn't do it. So when the student would write something like, yes, I agree, as their post, because that didn't meet the requirements, I wouldn't give them credit for that week. And what's really interesting to me, and this is what this yellow bar represents, that if the students that had attempted to participate but just didn't follow the rules versus somebody that didn't participate at all, if they had been prompted by the AI and Packback, so each time they were posting a question, Packback would have prompted the student with a reminder of here's what makes a good question. Or if they were um, writing a response, it would say here's how you put this sort of response. Here are some things to include. Consider putting this in there. If the students had been given those kinds of prompts, it's very likely that I could have had almost the same level of participation. So again, it isn't just enough to give the students the rules. They do need to be constantly reminded of those rules, which if you're having to do that yourself in the learning management system, is going to take away a lot of your time. So this is one of those benefits of that artificial intelligence working behind the scenes for you. So how do I actually make Packback work for me? I mean, I keep talking about how it's great, it's been helping my students, but what do I actually do? Well, the first thing I do is just contact my rep at Packback and they do all the setup for me. I just say, here, here's the course or courses that I'm gonna need. All right, and they take care of everything. They get the course set up, they send me syllabus examples, they send me materials that I can use on the first day. They have, again, lined me up with a dedicated experience manager who works with me one-on-one, -on -one, who I can call all the time and ask all kinds of questions. And usually within a couple minutes, if not a couple hours, is gonna have everything worked out for me. And what's also really nice is that they also have really good tech support for the student. So I don't have to be the tech support. So if the student is having an issue, the student can just reach out to Packback and they usually are able to fix it very quickly. Um, I think the longest was one time it took them about 24 hours. And that was the longest it's taken. Usually it's very fixed right away. I also have a weekly requirement where students are asked to post a certain amount of things. Again, they get all or none credit. And this replaced what I had previously been doing for participation. So I'm giving them about 10% of their course grade for participating in Packback. And again, I'm counting it as what used to be their participation grade. What's most exciting though is that grading takes very little time. It can, takes me usually no longer than about 15 minutes. And this is for some of those really big, you know, 200 people classes. Because um, all I'm doing is deciding whether or not they fulfilled the weekly requirement. Usually it's one post, excuse me, one question and two responses. So I'm looking one and two. And I bring up my grade book and I put five enter, five enter, zero enter, five enter. It takes very, very little time. Why that is so exciting is because that frees up my time, whatever time I have left, if that's just another five minutes or if that's the rest of the hour, to actually go through and do real teaching. So I'm not doing moderating. I'm not making sure they met criteria because pack back good all that. I'm actually then able to go through and give the coaching and giving the praising, particularly that praising, so that students can see what are the good things that students have been up to and hopefully copy that example. What I also think is very helpful is to start the course with seated questions that demonstrate good kinds of questions that they can ask. I'll talk about more of that in a second. I always use the positive reinforcement models of the praising and the coaching. Again, however much time I have, sometimes that's five minutes, sometimes that's an hour. I do that every single week if I can, because that's just gonna help the course itself flow as well as the students to get as much maximum learning out of it as possible. And then I also have a few slightly different strategies that I do with online classes versus traditional classes, but I have used Packback in both and it works very effectively. 
So here are some examples of some of the seeded questions that I might start a class with. And again, my, my specific examples are very much geared towards my discipline. So I want you to more focus on the, the rough categories of things here so that you can hopefully apply it to your discipline. So for example, one of the things that I like to do is to compare two different terms or concepts. So I'll take something that we've been discussing or that we're going to discuss in the class and I'll say, okay, defend your choice. If you had to have this or this, which one is better or which one is worse or which one made the biggest impact? So taking those two terms and concepts because then it forces the student to pick a side because there isn't a right or wrong. You just said defend their choice and then actually have to defend it. And that's where the critical thinking piece comes in because they have to not only know the term, but kind of understand how it works. So with an example from physiological psychology, would it be worse to have no sensory neurons or no motor neurons? Again, there's no right or wrong answer, but the students have to pick a side and defend it. Related to that, I give them, um, for example, two real life examples. So I take two case studies and I say, would you rather experience this as this case study as this person or experience life as this person or this case study? You could absolutely do this with things like policies, which policy had the most impact or which policy is the most positive or had the best results or worst results. You could do it with things like which researcher had the most impact on this field and having them compare two researchers. But again, now they're looking at real life or real life people or examples, and they're having to then defend their answer. And then the final thing that's related to these that I love to do to show them how they can discuss actual peer reviewed literature is I try to pick out articles that have been published fairly recently. This one example here is based on a study that came out a few years ago about traumatic brain injury in football players, and then just have them discuss it, but asking them to use the paper as their evidence. So again, speaking from a scientific perspective, should people be allowed to play football? So they have to read through the article, pick yes or no, and then use evidence from the article. And they won't always do that as part of the discussion, but at least some of them will go through and pick it out. And the students can then see that, which students used the actual article as evidence. And again, that's the skill that I'm trying to get them to do is to back up what they're saying, not just with opinion, but with actual, in this case, scientific evidence. So one other interesting thing that I really love that Packback does automatically for you is for every single thing that a student posts, it gives them what they call a curiosity score. So it kind of ranks their posts, grades their posts, um, it gives it a score. And that score is based on several things. It's based 20% on credibility, um, it's based 20% on presentation, and it's based 60% on effort. And what's really neat is that the student gets automatic feedback. So before there's even been moderation or coaching or praising or any of that, um, very true to their need for social media feedback, the student is going to automatically get a score from zero to 100 points with, again, a higher score, meaning this was a higher quality post, a lower score, meaning a lower quality post. So they can compete with themselves or they can even compete with other posts that they've seen to see if they can get higher quality scores. And this just encourages them each week, each time they post, each day, whatever it is, to constantly be striving to increase what they do within their posts so that there's a better experience for them and for everyone else. So what I really want you to do, um, again, we didn't put this on a note card that was left from my former presentation, but if you'll check wherever you scribbled down your question, I want you to see, imagine for just a minute, how well do you think you would have done if you had typed that question into Packback? How well do you think you would have gotten? Maybe you won't know your exact curiosity score just yet, but did you have an open-ended question? Or was it a closed-ended question? Did you give all right, the person that might be responding to your question opportunity to defend themselves, to kind of pick a side or pick an angle and come up with a choice or a way to discuss it? All right, so kind of evaluate yourself and how you would have done um, and give yourself just a minute. If you're really curious about um, your particular question and you want to see your exact curiosity score, or even if you're just interested in joining with fellow faculty that have been using Packback for a while and just want to help each other share ideas, share strategies, share teaching tips, um, I encourage you to join the global faculty community. So I am actually in within this community. I'm, I'm one of the moderators of the community. And what I really love about this is that this is faculty from all over, all different disciplines. So you start out in a larger community. You can sub-select to interact with folks within your specific discipline. But what we have been doing within this community is just sharing ideas, sharing strategies. And again, not just specific to Packback, although we have discussed that, but just in general. How do you teach? How do you learn? 
learn? What have you been doing? What works with your students? What might you want to try, et cetera, et cetera. So it's been a really great resource um, and hopefully it will just continue to expand and becoming a great resource there. And um, they have sent you the information in the chat as well as down here if you're interested in a demo, so using Packback or joining the actual global community, you can just contact them and they will definitely get you joined up. I hope to see everybody within that community. And then as I mentioned earlier, I do slightly different things depending on which type of class that I'm teaching. So if I'm teaching online, I find that I need a lot more praising and coaching just because it keeps that feel of the interaction going because that's the biggest thing they're missing being online is they don't get to interact with each other. I also find that if I find a post that's really, really good, so besides highlighting it and featuring it and praising it within Packback, I also can copy and paste it and send it once more in their learning management system and just say, hey, this was a really great question in Packback. I highly suggest that everybody log into Packback and try to respond to it. Here's why it was so good. See if you can copy this style. One of the things that I do in my traditional face-to-face -face classes is I always start every class um, with packbacks. So I just have it brought up there. I've pre-screened for a really good question or a really good answer. And I love to give students kudos. So I'll say, hey, where is student A? And I'll wait for them to raise their hand and I'll say, student A, this was phenomenal. Let's talk about what student A did that was so good. They did this or this or this, or they asked this type of question, or they had this thing, or they linked a peer-reviewed article, or whatever was good about it. And then I encourage students, all right, I want you to go home tonight and see if you can copy what student A did. See if you can do this same type of behavior and maybe I'll call you out next class. Also, um, there's always those times in class where a student will ask a spontaneous question. Most of the time those questions are really good, but a little bit complicated and you may or may not have time to answer it all. What I also love to do when a student asks those questions is give a very brief answer in class and then say, this was a super good question. Make that your pack back question this week. Make yourself a note so that when you go home, this can be your pack back question this week because this is really good and I want us to continue this conversation. And you, it, it's really funny the ripple that'll go through the class. The one student will be like, Yeah, I got my pack back question. And everybody's like, Oh, I wish I'd thought of that because then I'd have a pack back question. So it's really funny to kind of see how the students interact. The other couple things that I do, um, really quick, I have an extra credit trick. So a lot of people are concerned about whether or not the you know, students are posting incorrect information. First of all, at least with my classes, I haven't seen a lot of that, um, but I'm also lazy and I encourage you to be lazy. And what I mean by that is let's use some tricks and let the artificial intelligence do what it's gonna do. And then also let students help you out. And here's what I do. I offer a standing extra credit in my class that if a student is reading a post that has some incorrect information in it and it hasn't already been corrected, meaning somebody further down in the post has not already said, I don't think that's right, it's actually this. Right? They can take a private screenshot of it and send it to me in a private email, and I'll give them one point of extra credit. The maximum amount of points I've ever given out in one semester is like, it was either four or five, I don't remember. Again, there's not gonna be a ton of misinformation out there, but this does two things. One, again, allows you to be lazy so that you don't have to screen, moderate, and worry about reading every single question. You can, again, focus on the really, really good questions and the positive reinforcement. But two, the students are studying because they love to find it when things are wrong. Right? And they love this activity, but they don't realize that, that as they're reading and scanning, looking for things that are wrong, they're learning the things that are right, and they're inadvertently studying. So it's a really cool trick. And then the other thing that I tell them is that really good questions might end up on a quiz or an exam, and that always gets them really excited. So this kind of um, is about to finish up um, what I tend to do and what I have found exciting. But again, I'm really pleased that the way I teach and the way I am um, inspired goes with Packback's core objective. So their third objective that I hadn't quite gotten to yet is that it fuels purpose and curiosity of the subject matter. And I've actually seen that. Students have given me some really great feedback. Um, here are some things that students have said about the course, um, that it was a helpful, non-judgmental, and a great resource for learning. I thought that was really neat, that they liked going into the Packback and discussing it. They felt that it was a very easy um, community to participate in. They felt that Packback was more effective. Um, they said they liked that the questions had to be open-ended and that Packback would actually check for that, which I think is really cool. Um, I think it's a great way to go above and beyond in course materials. So I thought that was a really great piece of feedback. And then finally, the student actually acknowledged that it did make them think more critically about what it was doing besides just the grade itself, which I thought was really inspiring. 
So somebody asked me in the chat, um, how much variation do I get in student grades from pack back discussions? Um, are we talking overall grades or I'm not quite sure. Can you give me a tiny bit more information and let me see what you mean there? And I'll be happy to try to give you a little more detail about that. Um, the, the data slide that I showed, again, I get significantly higher grades when I make students write and I get significantly higher numbers of A's and B's overall grades of A's and B's when my students use PackBack specifically. And then the other piece of data that I have is that students do significantly better on writing assignments. The multiple choice is about the same between all of the sections, but their ability to write and to communicate within the discipline is better when they have used PackBack. Um, beyond that, I'm not quite sure what you meant and I would love for you to follow up on your question so I can answer it better. So if I had to summarize what makes Packback different, particularly from the LMS that I've been using, is that it allows, while both allow for threaded discussions um, and grading within the LMS, Packback is really good because it keeps everything in one place. I don't have to create an individual spot for weekly discussion. It's all in one place that students can go back, particularly for material that builds upon itself, even if it might be a different week, they can go back and respond to a different post once they've gotten new information. I love the artificial intelligence. Again, keeping that minimum standard for posting, it won't even let them post it if it has not met the minimum standard. It checks things behind the scenes like plagiarism, closed-ended questions, all the things that I would have wanted to screen out. The artificial intelligence is doing that for me. It easily allows me to give feedback. So it allows me to say, this was really good, or you might want to work on this just a little bit. Um, it allows me to search for posts so I can look for the things that students are really interested in. What are the things that they're really discussing? What have they had a big conversation about? Or what I also love to do is to find the questions that are really good that nobody has commented on. Because sometimes those are the best questions. It just means they're a little more challenging and nobody knew how to answer it. I also love to call those kinds of questions out in class and say, this was really great. Maybe let's explore an answer for this. So it gives me really good guidance on what to kind of discuss in class. So if I really had to summarize why Packback is different, one of the things is that it's helping students move to that next level of learning. So this is sort of based here on Bloom's taxonomy, if you're familiar with that. So that most of the time, all I have a chance to really get to, particularly in huge sections, is just can they remember the information and can they understand the information? And what's really nice is that Packback easily allows me to jump into those higher tiered skills. So things like applying, analyzing, evaluating the material that we're talking about. So I don't have to spend a bunch of extra time and effort grading, but they spend a bunch of extra time working on some of those higher level skills. And essentially it just makes more time for actual teaching and less time for moderating so that I don't feel like this as we go throughout the semester. I feel a lot more in control. My students feel like they're getting what they need. They feel like they're hearing back from me on a lot more regular basis. And I just feel like the students are getting a lot better experience. So with that, I'm going to end and I'm going to take any questions that anybody might have. Again, feel free to ask those questions um, in our discussion and I'll try to answer those. Student scores. I'm reading the one question here. How much variance is in student scores on PackBack assignments? I'm worried that the grade distribution will get too narrow. So are you talking about like the weekly scores that I give the students? Because most of the time students um, that use PackBack, um, again, about 90% participation, they're going to get their scores, which is why I keep it at about a 10% or less of their overall grade. You want to give them some points for doing it just so that they're motivated. Um, now, again, how much did Packback affect their other assignments? Again, I am still seeing a distribution. I didn't see all A's and B's. I still had students that got C's. I still had students that got D's and F's. And I have seen that consistently in all my classes. What I tend to think, though, is that it's bumping up the students a little, all students a little. Um, I haven't yet seen some kind of weird grade distribution where I had everybody getting an A or everybody you know, shifting one way or the other. So I don't think my grade distributions have gotten too narrow. Um, if anything, I think it actually helps spread it out. So if you look at my normal grade distribution before using Packback, I actually almost was too cramped with the other side of the spectrum. I had way too many DFs and Ws. And actually what I think has happened is that it's spread it 
back the other way. Um, in other classes, for example, in intro, we do usually have more of a normal distribution. We haven't seen too much of a horrible shift. And what I mean by that is we have seen a little bit more of a shift towards a few more Bs, a few more As, um, but not so many that we think we're jeopardizing our actual grade distributions at the end of a semester. So hopefully that answers your question. So somebody's asking specifically about a discipline of biochemistry. I actually really like some of the more hard sciences because I think it, it is more difficult to kind of initiate a conversation. Um, one of my favorite things that you could do in biochemistry is propose, for example, two different pathways that they're having to learn um, and say which one, if one of these stopped working, which one would be the most critical, which would cause the most significant feedback, um, which would cause the biggest problem for the individual or for the system that we're talking about. Um, you could have them debate researchers. So you could say, you know, scientist A and scientist B, which has made the biggest contribution and why, which is the most important contribution and why. Because again, there's no right or wrong answer. The student would then just have to defend what it is that they feel and what's going on. What's also neat about some of the biochemistry um, or physics or math or some of those hard disciplines is if you have some sort of formula or something that the student would want to have, you can actually include pictures and attachments in your posting and in your question. So you could even do things like post a particular thing and say, how did you memorize this? And again, slightly different, but it would then lead to teaching strategies that the students could share with each other and say, oh, well, for memorizing that, I did this and this and this, or I used this strategy, or I used that strategy, or here's how I solved that formula. So hopefully that gives you a few ideas there. If you want some more specifics, I'd, I'd love to schedule an individual conversation or email chat with you. We could definitely brainstorm some more ideas for biochemistry. Um, interested in the packback scores, my, my average participation is about 90%, which is phenomenal, especially in big classes. Um, but again, that's important, especially if your class is online. You want them to have that connection with each other because you don't get to check in with them on a weekly or biweekly basis. So that's really important. And definitely you're going to see improvement. The more writing that you're having your students do for exams and quizzes and things, the more packback is going to help because that's where I saw the biggest improvements in their grades was in their writing skills. Great. Well, Dr. West, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. Um, I have one closing question for you. Uh, our purpose, of course, being to awaken and fuel lifelong curiosity. Um, We'd love to know on the PACBAC team, what are you curious? Uh, you've shared with us some of the, the research and studies to date you've done on your community. What are you looking ahead uh, at studying and um, pulling you know, insights out of your PACBAC community? What, what is it that you're uh, forward looking curious about to uh, learn from your colleagues? Absolutely, so I actually am, hopefully going to be lining up another study soon. I'm curious about several things. One of them is a cross-discipline study. So is this specific to psychology? I mean, that is my discipline or does this apply elsewhere? So I hopefully have a few colleagues that are going to be teaming up with me. We're going to try to do it in several different intro sections. We figured that was maybe the most similar between different disciplines. And we're going to see if we see some interesting data looking at packback usage among different intro classes versus non usage in different intro disciplines. So that's one of the places that we're headed. I'm hoping within the next semester or two we'll, we'll be able to get that coordinated. And then the other one that I'm going to look at um, personally is your experience in college. So whether or not this is more impactful for the brand new student, for the freshman that's coming just out of high school, or whether or not this is more impactful as you've been in college for a while, so that junior or that senior. So I'm going to be comparing some of my different classes and the different students within some of those classes as far as their level to see if it makes a, a bigger difference. Um, you know, if this is something that we started right away as a freshman, if that's going to make a bigger difference, you know, by the time they've gotten to a senior, is it too late or is it still going to be just as impactful? So those are some of the directions that me and my team are headed. Um, I'm really kind of excited about moving forward. It just takes a little bit of coordination. So hopefully within the next couple of semesters, you'll see some more interesting stuff from us. Great. Well, fascinating. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you are certainly an exemplar of continuously curious as an educator. Uh, folks, that is our webinar today. Signing off with Dr. Kat West. Thank everybody so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.